All right, hello everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. It's my pleasure to be your presenter. My name is Mitch Muncy, and I started my career here at MSC, now Hexagon, over 20 years ago as an intern. I'm now responsible for the MSC Apex product line, and it's my pleasure today to talk to you about nonlinear analysis. For me, nonlinear is one of those things that's incre incredibly easy to set up. It's challenging to get just right, but it's oh so rewarding when you, when you do. Now, we're not gonna have enough time to make you an expert today, but we are planning to give a quick and very broad introduction. Um, we're going to cover the difference between linear and nonlinear analysis and what modeling changes it takes to move from one to the other. We're going to look at the different types of nonlinearities to watch out for and try to understand when a nonlinear model will be required. I have some good examples to demonstrate what these look like both in practice in general and what we see in aerospace and automotive industries. And one of the most important aspects of nonlinear analysis is making sure that your models are set up correctly to solve. Uh, so I'm going to share some tips and tricks for that. And finally, since we're only touching on this subject at a very high level, and I know you're going to be interested in learning more, I've saved some of my favorite resources for the end. So now I'm obviously going to be focused on MSC Apex, and I've been using MSC Nastran for my entire career. So there's going to be a lot of that. Uh, but most of these concepts can be applied to other products as well. So let's get started. And we'll start with a, a review of linear analysis. Uh, it's called linear analysis because a system of linear equations are solved. And if you think about that spring, as you increase the load, the displacement follows linearly. And if we can assume everything is linear, there are a few things that fall out of this. First, the loads are independent of deformation. This means as your model starts to bend, we're going to keep the loads in the same direction, not any updated one. We also assume that displacements are directly proportional to the loads. This way, if you want to know what your displacements or stresses are going to be when you double your load, you don't need to run another analysis to, to understand that. It's just going to be double. Finally, uh, results for different loads can be superimposed. So similarly to the last point, if you have a load in X and you have a load in Y and you want to know what it looks like when those two things are combined, it literally is just a combination of the two. So oftentimes in your linear analysis, we're only going to have a small number of load cases and the results are generated by linearly combining these uh, in post-processing. So as you can imagine, this also means that the final results do not depend on the sequence of the applied loads as well. In linear analysis, there's this re linear relationship between the displacement degrees of freedom and other quantities, such as element stresses. You can determine the displacements of the nodes in element coordinates by multiplying them by a transformation matrix for each element. Then element strains can be derived from those element displacements in terms of the stress strain displacement matrix. These element strains can be then converted to stresses based on materials con constitutive law. From the element stresses, you can determine element forces, and those forces in the element coordinate system can be converted back to the global coordinate system using a transformation matrix. When summed, those element forces will equal the applied loads, since the applied loads must be in equilibrium with the internal loads. And finally, the constraints on a linear model are constant. The key point in all of these relationships is that they are all linear relationships. The matrices used for these transformations from the displacements are all constant, and independent of either load or displacement. Now, in a nonlinear analysis, these relationships change. The equations are no longer linear, and the matrices change as a function of the applied load and displacement. For geometric nonlinearity with large displacement and rotations, the strain displacement transformation between element coordinates and global coordinates can change. Large rotations can also change multi point constraints and rigid elements. Similarly, if there are follower forces, the transformation between element forces and global coordinates can change. For large strain problems and material nonlinearity, the compatibility and constitutive relationships change, and contact can change the load pass by changing the constraints on the model. In short, k times u still equals p, but k changes depending on the value of u and p. 
So next, we're going to look at uh, how we determined u when k is not constant. And the answer to that is uh, just to iterate. So that is to apply a fraction of the load, uh, delta p in our case, and then take a guess at what k is by extrapolating. We determine u from the guessed k and then see just how far the solution is from being in equilibrium. We iterate on the stiffness and displacement until you achieve a result whose k is consistent with the calculated u and is in equilibrium. Then we repeat this process with an additional incremental fraction of the load until you've applied all of your load. Contact and constraint changes can cause nonlinearity because the load path changes with displacement. Nonlinear problems can be classified into three broad categories, geometric nonlinearity, material nonlinearity, and boundary condition nonlinearity. Contact problems exhibit nonlinear effects due to changes in boundary conditions. If there's a change in constraint due to contact during loading, any problem can be classified as a boundary nonlinear problem. MSC Natran supports uh, contact between two surfaces, between surfaces and edge, between two edges, between beams as well. Uh, contact can be defined on flexible bodies. It could be you know, between a flexible body and a rigid body. Um, two types of constraints can be applied to uh, a geometric model, single point constraints and multi-point constraints. Now, geometric, nonlinear, geometric nonlinearity involves problems with large displacements and rotations in contrast to the small displacements that we see in linear analysis. Uh, two types of phenomena are possible in cases of geometric nonlinearity, large displacement, small strain, and large displacement, large strain. For the large displacement, small strain problem, changes in the stress-strain law can be neglected but the contributions from the nonlinear terms in the strain displacement relationship can't be neglected. Classic examples of this are flat membranes that stiffen as they're pressed, uh, post buckled structures, and faller forces that change direction as the structure rotates. Now, in the case of large displacement and rotation and large strain problems, the strain developed is a lot higher and can result in permanent deformation or damage. So we can see this phenomenon here in these examples. In one case, the metal is being severely formed, resulting in permanent deformation due to high strain. And in the other case, the rubber bearing is undergoing large distortion due to strain induced by the high boundary conditions. More examples of geometric nonlinearity include buckling and snap through. In both these cases, the stiffness of the structure can dramatically change and quickly, making them particularly challenging. A classic example is snap-through buckling. So if you can consider a shallow spherical cap, um, we can increase the load at a certain level. The shallow cap is going to snap through and become inverted. Uh, cat catastrophic failure is not going to happen uh, in this inverted shape, but it's good because it's still capable of taking a load. However, it might not be suitable for the purposes of which it was designed. Another aspect of geometric nonlinearity is follower forces. In this phenomenon, follower forces applied on a body follow the direction of displacement of the body. The examples shown on this page represent this phenomenon. We can see the forces are changing uh, as their direction changes with the displacement or rotation. Uh, the effect of temperature loads can also change due to large displacements. There are a lot of different ways uh, materials can be nonlinear as well. For nonlinear elastic materials, the structure remains uh, in its original shape when unloaded, so there's no permanent deformation, uh, but the material stiffness changes with the magnitude or direction of the applied load. A special case of nonlinear elastic is hyperelastic materials, which display a changing material stiffness, but also can have very large strains and a Poisson's ratio close to a mathematical limit of 0.5. Nonlinear materials can also display plasticity. Um, a plastic material may be, you know, may initially behave elastic, elastically, but at higher stresses, it takes on permanent plastic deformation and remains even if the part is unloaded. So if the load is reapplied, the material behavior can behave different due to work hardening and the presence of that plastic strain. So repeated load cycles can yield different results. Material nonlinearity, sorry, material nonlinearity can also be a function of temperature. 
Typically, materials become nonlinear at lower stresses uh, at, with high temperatures. So the rate that this load can be also affect the material nonlinearity. At high strain rates, the microstructure of the material literally doesn't have enough time to respond to the distortion in the same way that it does at lower strain rates. Creep is a, another example of time-dependent nonlinearity with creep strain changes over time, even when the load doesn't. With relax relaxation, load changes over time, even when the strain doesn't. And this is a result of giving the microstructure of the material more time to adapt to the distortion, resulting in realignment or flow of the material under stress. And this is particularly common at high temperatures. Uh, sheet memory alloys display a unique kind of material nonlinearity. An example of this is nickel titanium alloy, nitinol. When stretched, the material appears to undergo plastic deformation. Unlike normal plastic deformation, though, this one is reversible. The deformation is due to the material undergoing a phase change. So when heat is applied, the phase change is reversed and the material returns to its previously undeformed shape. For composites, material nonlinearity is a result of change in the microstructure of the composite. It could be matrix cracking, it could be fiber breakage, the fibers separating from the matrix, uh, delamination, and so on. This can resemble elastic plastic metal behavior in some regards, but since the material undergoes non-reversible deformation and reduction in stiffness is the result. Calculating this accumulated damage is much more complicated in composites due to the interaction between the fibers and the matrix and the fact that the fibers in the matrix may them, themselves be nonlinear materials. MSC Nastran, we have a, a variety of criteria to predict when and how composites undergo damage, and the user can specify just how that affects the material sti stiffness and the load re redistribution. Some other material failure analyses, including uh, virtual crack closing technique and cohesive zone modeling are also nonlinear in nature as they change the stiffness and load paths in the model. In MARC, we can study what happens when um, material is removed, such as cutting or grinding. So to kind of let's start putting some of this together. I wanted to show as an example just kind of what this would look like with a very, very simple plastic stool. Um, and I'm gonna start with a few apologies up front. I'm American, I'm stuck in, Ameri in, in Imperial units. Um, I'm also not a designer, uh, if it's not already apparent. But what we've got here, it's a little plastic stool. It's about knee height. It's something that we wanna sit on and we wanted to see what would happen uh, with those types of loads. We've already applied the, the material, it's ABS plastic. The, the loads are minus 200 pounds in the Z direction, and we have a fixed constraint there on the feet. Since we're using shell elements, uh, we have a quarter inch thick shell property applied to it. So we're gonna start with linear static analysis. This is typically how you'd run this model initially, but I'd also recommend if you know you're gonna be doing nonlinear analysis, you should start with linear static anyway. Um, and when we look at the deformations for this, we can see it's actually quite high. Um, so this thing is about a meter tall and it's about two or three inches in, in displacement. Um, so, you know, if we didn't know any better, like I think first thing is you wanna look at the total load that's being applied and see that it's large deformation and we should consider a uh, nonlinear analysis. So let's take a look at that now. Switching from linear to nonlinear analysis in Apex is easy as creating just a new nonlinear scenario. Uh, the default for this is gonna be 10 increments. So earlier we talked about how you can break down and solve the load. It isn't necessary, but sometimes it's good to control these increments if you're trying to track where your material goes from elastic to plastic, or if you're working with contact. Uh, looking at the final increment, 100% uh, of the load, you can see that the actual deflection is much less. It's, it's about half of what we were seeing in linear static analysis. Uh, and this is primarily due to that stress stiffening effect, which we talked a little bit about before. And if you didn't notice that you had some large displacements going on and decided to run this model nonlinear, you may have gone down the path of a costly redesign. Next, 
I wanted to give a couple more examples in industry on how nonlinear analysis can be used. Uh, from, from the automotive industry, a pedal box assembly is a good example. We have follower forces, nonlinear materials, and depending on how hard you brake when someone cuts you off, uh, you can also see some very large deformations. Uh, a leaf spring is a great example of contact. It also requires preloaded bolts. An engine manifold uses nonlinear materials with temperature dependent material properties. And in the world of batteries, the mounting frame includes quite a bit of contact, um, including contact with beam elements and typically requires uh, an impact analysis. Moving over to the aerospace world, some of the typical examples we want to include are wing tip deflection. These are typically very large displacements uh, and they also include local buckling. Stiffened door panels are, are very similar. They also can utilize glued connections. On the fuselage, there are pressure loads and follower forces and local panel buckling, uh, and then detailed stress analysis of wings to look at fastener loads and some other local stresses and contacts. So now let's take a look at some of the common issues that we run into with nonlinear analysis. You know, some of these are going to be software dependent uh, and, you know, and how you remedy them are going to be software dependent. But when you run nonlinear static analysis, there tends to be some common themes as well. Um, typically, you're going to be working with assembly models, and that means there's probably going to be a lot of contact in between those assemblies. Um, solution times for nonlinear analysis are going to be longer in practice than they would for a linear static analysis, as you can imagine when you split up your load into 10 increments and that increment takes multiple iterations to solve, you know, it can be anywhere from, you know, 10 times to hundreds times fast longer to solve that nonlinear analysis. And that just means it takes longer to, to debug. Uh, and when you're trying to chase down the issues that you have in the model, uh, it can be very tricky to understand what's happening with that. And then sometimes when you're trying to post-process it or understand what's going on, you can't get all the details of what you're looking for out of your pre and post-processor. So when working specifically with MSC NASTRAN, um, you can look at the F06 file. It has convergence uh, versus criteria. You can look for excessive cycling. You can look at your maximum displacements in the model. This is a, usually a good clue that something's floating away or you know, trying to, to, to move away from the rest of the model. Uh, you can look for signs of penetration. So if your contact isn't behaving the way that you'd like it to be, uh, that's one thing. And then cutbacks. Cutbacks are when it's failing to converge, it's going to do a cutback and try and, and, and pick that up again. So you know, typically you wanna look for these things and then you can stop that job as soon as things start to look bad. Um, and then if that job does fail, some strategies you can have are running it in SOL 101. So like I talked about before, typically we want to start with 101 and see if there's any issues. You can um, use param bailout as a, as a way of forcing it to give you some output. Uh, but I, I, you know, I think other than that, I would also recommend converting those touching contacts if it's supposed to be sliding or separating contact you want to convert that to glue and you can run modes and see uh, if the contact is, is, is connected and see how things are doing. Another little trick is to attach springs or constraints to parts of the model that you think might be flat floating away. Uh, this isn't something that you would want to do in the, the final analysis, but this is just a way of debugging it and trying to understand you know, where, where some of those, those parts are, are, are getting freed. And then if you're working specifically with bolts, you can apply force displacements instead of forces for uh, some of those preloads. But in Apex and MSC Nastran, there's actually a better way than all of this. Uh, we've got a tool that will export a Nastran SOL 400 job. Uh, it uses a, an alter that's going to terminate that job after just only a few iterations. So it's gonna run really really fast and then we're also going to write those non-converged results to an h5 file and we have a lot of little things that are turned on to help us understand what's going on in the model so vcon check is a way that we can understand more information about gaps or penetration 
uh, a gravity load is going to you know get the model moving and so if there's anything that's unconstrained it'll it'll show that up for us uh, because we're using gravity we have to have masses on everything in the model and that's automatically applied um, you know if we have anything that looks suspicious from the contact wave uh, that's going to be flagged as well in the GUI and then from here you know initial gaps penetrations those things can be easily detected and then we have uh, a way inside of Apex of adjusting the node locations based on all, all of this information. So let's let's take a look at something like this in practice. And then for this, we have a little bit more of a realistic scenario. This is a truck frame. It's something that we'll typically see in industry. It's got a lot of bolts, so it's got a lot of contact. Uh, and this is something that we, we wanna run for nonlinear analysis. The materials and properties are already applied. And for the bolts, we have a utility in Apex. So Apex ships with scripting utilities and someone who's created a Python script to automatically find all of the bolts and replace them with curves. And then we'll use these curves later when creating the, uh, the bolt elements. So for doing this one, we're gonna use a mixture of hex and tet elements. Um, you know, Apex, we definitely have the tools of doing an all hex mesh. And typically when you're running an nonlinear analysis, you want to Go ahead and do that hex mesh. But if you want to do things uh, quickly, we can just use tet elements where uh, it didn't automatically generate the the hex mesh for us, and that's and that's what we did here. So next, we'll go in and we'll create the contact between all of the parts. So when performing nonlinear analysis, I prefer to start with glued contact. Like I mentioned before, this helps root out. Uh, any of the other issues that you might have in the model. Like if you have nonlinear materials or um, any issues with buckling potentially, uh, you get those worked out before you have to start sorting out contact. And you know, visualization in Apex makes it easy to see all this automatically created contact in the patches. And typically this is gonna help you debug models uh, right away. Okay, so the uh, you know once we're done building those contacts, we've had a chance to validate the model, and we can confirm that it's behaving the way that we want to. We can convert those contacts to um, touching contact, and you can either go through and edit each one of those manually uh, and set it up exactly how you want it to be, or we can use automation for that as well. And so we have a little tool. It'll automatically convert all of our glue contact into touching contact and using uh, the settings that we specify. All right, the next step after that is to create those bolt elements. So we had those curves from before. This will create all the bolts, all of the preload, and it'll also create the contact for us. Next, we add our loads and constraints, kind of skip a little head for you there. And then uh, what we'll want to do is go in and set up our nonlinear scenario. So by default, the, the one that's already in Apex is gonna be static. So we can delete this one, uh, and then we can start adding the job that we wanna do for nonlinear analysis. So for this job, we're gonna be including our bolt preload. And the way that we do that with MSC Nastran is with three steps. So step one um, is where we can apply that bolt preload. Step two is where we hold that preload fixed. And then step three is where we're going to apply uh, those, those um, external loads. Okay, so if we just go into our loads and constraints, you can see they're all here. Our three steps are at the top and we can pick and choose how we want to apply it and hold it through the analysis. So we'll apply the, the bulk preloads in the first step and they're gonna be held through the, the, the analysis. We'll apply our external loads in the third step and then we'll make sure that the constraints are included in, in, in all of these. Now, before we run this model, this is where we would use that MSC Nastran to perform a debug run.
And so we can use this to help identify if there's any missing contacts. And like I said, it's going to stop the job after only three iterations, which makes it run very fast. And it's going to output the contact status, the deform shape. And this is very helpful for identifying any potential issues. So we're going to post process the debug data the same way we would any other result. Uh, starting with the contact status, we can see right away that there are bolts with missing contacts. Using an exploded view, we can get a good idea of what's happening inside the assembly as well. And finally, if we switch over and look at a fringe plot of the displacements, you can see uh, the bolts are free. Now, we have many different tools we can use to identify the issue, but if we look at a slice view, you can see there's a small gap in the contact. And we can use a distance tool to measure the size of this gap. And we know from the way that we set our model up, this gap is large enough for the contact to be ignored. So what we're going to do is we'll update the contact and rerun the de debug analysis. And now that contact is being included, and we can check to see just how much of it needs to be adjusted. So this time we're going to look at the contact adjustment vectors. And this will let us know, you know which bolts need to be repositioned uh, so that we can solve the full analysis. It's a very helpful way of identifying where it's going on. And, and inside of Apex, we have some really nice tools to reposition those bolts. OK, so let's take a look at some of the nonlinear results. We've scaled up the deformation so we can see some of the pre-stress from the bolts. Um, we can isolate just the frame if we're interested in looking at, um, for instance, if we want to look at some of the friction forces, um, we can look at the friction in the normal direction. And we can look at you know, pretty much any of the data that we want to look at for nonlinear analysis. OK, so for our purposes today, we've mostly been talking about nonlinear static analysis, but you can also solve uh, nonlinear in the time domain with nonlinear transient, which uses an implicit solver. Or you could also do something uh, like DITRAN for explicit dynamic analysis. Moving to explicit dynamics is a bit of a tricky beast if you're coming from an implicit background. The first thing to know is that explicit analyses are conditionally stable, and to do so, it requires a very, very, very small time step. Uh, the good news for explicit dynamics is that each one of these time steps run very quickly, and so you don't encounter the same convergence issues that you'll find with an implicit solver, and this is why an explicit solver is typically preferred for very high strain rates, advanced physics, uh, and but most importantly, very short duration events. Um, if, it, if it's a, a, longer, um, a longer example, it, it's going to take much, much longer for an explicit solver to run than it would for an implicit one. OK, so that's why when you look at explicit dynamics, these are typically used for impact problems, short duration, like drop test or car crash. Uh, the example we have here on the right is called a fan blade out from aerospace. Uh, this is using DITRAN and PATRAN. Now, I feel like I've touched on a lot of our different products today. We've mostly been talking about nonlinear analysis with MSC NASTRAN and MSC APEX, uh, but we've also talked about some of the advanced implicit analysis with MARC. Uh, we've just touched on explicit dynamics with DITRAN and PATRAN, and I feel it's really important to note that all of these products and many more, such as Atoms for multi-body dynamics, Simufact for manufacturing simulation, Digimat for materials, Actran for NVH, Cradle for CFD, and some of our newer acquisitions like Romax and CA Fatigue, these are included in the MSC1 token licensing system. 
Uh, this system also includes interactive learning, and if you're interested in learning more about the products and you know the, the practice behind it. So if you've never heard of this, I would definitely suggest you check it out. And if you're a smaller company, you should also check out MSC One Start Edition. I'm not going to share any of the details of the pricing here, but I think it's safe to say that you'll be shocked just how affordable it is for access to all of these tools. All right, sales pitch out of the way. Let's talk a little bit more of where, where you can get some more information on this. Um, like I mentioned at the top, I'm just gonna scratch the surface. So hopefully you, we've created some interest in trying to become an expert. And there's a lot of good information out there. And so I'm just gonna start with some of my favorites. First, I would highly recommend NAFAM's e-learning training courses, and especially anything taught by Tony Abbey. Uh, you're probably already following him on LinkedIn, and you know that Tony has a wealth of inf uh, uh, finite element knowledge. And the NAFAM's courses specifically are software agnostic, so the principles you learn can be replied regardless of the product that you're using. And I saw that there's a, a class coming up in February, and I know these tend to sell out. So if you're interested, you should try and register as soon as possible. The second one I think is great, uh, you know, if you're looking for a background in theory. It's a, it's a recording from the archives taught by Aute. It, I think it's, you know, MIT, MIT does a great job in hosting these. And if you really like this class, they also have one on linear statics as well. The software you mentioned is not one of ours, but I'm not going to judge. So next, if you are using MSC Apex and MSC uh, Nastran, our, our partner EvoTech has a great series on nonlinear analysis. It's a great introduction to linear as well. So both courses are taught by EvoTech. Uh, EvoTech is a longtime Hexagon partner and has trained many of our customers. So in the intro to nonlinear class, there are many workable example problems. It goes into many more details about how to troubleshoot your analysis when it fails to solve than I was able to get to today. And all of these example problems are video narrated and provide a step-by-step -step guide uh, to the nonlinear analysis. So really, really good introduction to that. And finally, for those Hexagon customers on the call, you may know this already, but if not, Sim Companion is a wonderful resource for learning more about any subject. Uh, looking specifically at Sol 400, there are many guides to get you started, uh, improve and debug your nonlinear analysis, Particularly, I'd like to highlight the work that our support team does with Sim Academy. So Sim Academy includes, uh, you know, an overview of a subject. It's going to include a demo model that you can work with and, and try out on your own. And these are uh, a great way of getting in and learning and starting to play with some of these new topics. Earlier this year, Hanson Chang had one on Sol 400. So I would definitely recommend you go check that out if you get a chance. And finally, if you don't have access to the software today and you're interested in getting your hands on MSC Apex and MSC Nastran and try it out for yourself, uh, we offer a 30-day free trial. So and with that, I think we're at the end of the webinar and I wanted to thank you all for attending. I will be following up with some of the links I just shared in the presentation and help answer any questions you might have. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.